Um, if you could all join me in, in uh, introducing our presenter, uh, Devarvat Shah, who is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thanks everyone uh, for being here. And uh, as, uh, as my uh, colleague, uh, uh, Tawheed Zaman, just told me that now I'm to the big leagues, so it's really glad to be here. Just as a quick uh, introduction, I'm a professor in electrical engineering and computer science, I course six in MIT Speak. I've been there teaching uh, statistics, machine learning, uh, data science uh, for past 15 years. Uh, that's the type of things I like to think about. Uh, that's my research topic. And what I'm going to talk, tell you today is related to that in a specific uh, context, which is uh, my passion, given that I grew up in subcontinent, cricket. Uh, I'm also director of statistics and data science, which is the statistics and data science department equivalent at MIT. Uh, this started out as a project, uh, as a thesis, as a curiosity with uh, Mohammed Jahangir Amjad, who is sitting and hiding there somewhere in the corner. Uh, one of my former PhD students, uh, now, now lecturer of machine learning at MIT in EECS, also a researcher at Google. And he is uh, from Pakistan, I'm from India. And you know, when we started working together, our dream was that, look, no matter what we end up doing, we got to make sure that we do something interesting for cricket. And we didn't know what. So, but this five years passed and something really interesting happened and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Uh, our collaborator Vishal Mishra, he's a professor of computer science at Columbia. Uh, his first and uh, I think most important passion is cricket. Like when he was a grad student, uh, he started this microblogging uh, site of, called Crickinfo, which is part of ESPN, one of the largest uh, 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 site. Uh, both Vishal and I are a technical advisor for um, uh, a cricket uh, fantasy game called, uh, team called Dream 11. All right, now I'm gonna talk a lot about cricket and it's likely that you are not, uh, you don't know what cricket is or maybe after I tell you and I still try to convince you cricket is interesting and you still don't get convinced it's interesting. So here is an alternative way to think about the entire talk, okay? So let's imagine that Here's a coin, okay, and you and I are gonna use this coin for whatever reason, and for whatever reason, I tell you that the bias of this coin is exactly 0.5, and you don't believe in that because you don't trust me, and that's a fair thing to do. So what should we do? Well, I give you this coin, or you give, or I keep this coin, and I'm gonna say here's, you will say, okay, toss it. I'm gonna to toss it 10 times. Let's say six times you see heads, four times you see tails, and then your conclusion would be that its bias is what? 0.6, all right. Now, well, I mean, so should you believe it or not? Well, here is the problem. Since I have tossed it only 10 times, either you would be able to estimate it to be 0 0.4, 0 0.5, or 0 0.6, right? There's no way to resolve it beyond 1 tenth, okay? In this talk, what I would eventually convince you that you can get better estimate of this coin without tossing ever any more again much better than one tenth. Okay, let me repeat. I'm not going to toss this coin anymore. And you somehow miraculously figure out how to estimate bias of this coin better in, within better accuracy than 0.1. Okay, that's another way to look at this talk. So in case cricket doesn't uh, uh, make you feel uh, excited, that's another way to look at it. All right, so with that, let's get started. So, just sort of uh, as, a, uh, as a sort of introducing this, the first international game of cricket was played in 1844. Okay, and uh, just as a contrast, soccer is a very respectable game, everybody knows about that. That was started in 1872. So at least in one dimension, it's a little bit, it, it was a little ahead of soccer. Now you may ask question, uh, what, who were the teams which played cricket f uh, first game? All right, some gentleman has a good answer. Excellent, he looked at my slides. <laughs> no, but that was an amazing answer because first time somebody asked me this question, my guess was that it must be, must be Britain and Australia, and that is not right. Uh, and the game was played in this country, so that's, uh, that's sort of close to it. Now you might still say that, well, that's all history, who cares about history, what about now? And then you can sort of do a Google search like this, saying that sort of how many fans are there, and then sort of 
by fans, turns out after soccer, it's the second most popular. So like uh, two and a half billion fans that are out there. Of course, those majority of those two and a half billion fans are not on this continent, but on some other continent, but that remains a fact. Uh, more than billion viewers watch uh, popular games, like if India and Pakistan were playing, that's a number you would find for sure. All right, so that's roughly sort of, uh, this is the context of cricket. What are the rules? How is it played? So here is a quick primer. It's played between two teams, like most other sports. Okay. Uh, closest to cricket is baseball. So if we try to sort of do matching of, uh, let's say, the terminology, in cricket, what's ball? In baseball, it's pitches. In cricket, what's over? It's effectively six balls or six pitches. Uh, an inning in uh, cricket is like 300 balls. Now, in cricket, unlike baseball, there are only one inning. That is, each team bats once and balls once. In baseball, that happens nine times. Okay? So in that sense, it's an asymmetric game, and that actually creates lots of hard statistical problems, actually, in the cricket, and we'll discuss that in a second. Uh, cricket uh, has, in each inning, there are 10 wickets where sort of, or 10 times players can get out from a given team. Now, the way game is played is that during those 300 balls, a team bats, and either team loses all of its 10 wickets or 10 outs, and then game stops, there, for their inning stops there, or they use all the 300 balls and make some number of runs. Unlike baseball, number of runs are a lot more. Think of in each inning, a numbers, number could be between 250 to 350. Okay, those are the numbers, which are much higher numbers, a lot more continuous in that sense, like closer to basketball where you see lots of numbers versus soccer where you see few scores. Okay. Um, and how does the decision happen? Of course, at the end of the day, both team bats, and whoever makes more runs at the end of the day wins. Okay. So it's very simple that way. All right, so now we all know uh, that cricket is an interesting game, at least for a subset of population, a large enough subset of population, and it is... Interesting rules, close to baseball, but very different in some sense. What we wanted to do and what we want to do is we want to bring statistics and machine learning to cricket. And our interest is at some level academic, at some level very much fan driven, uh, and at some level actually improving the rules of the game because within cricket, statistics and machine learning is a first class citizen. It's like, um, and I will come back to this in a second, but there are rules of the game are fundamentally driven by statistical methods. Okay? So uh, it's very sort of, uh, in a sense, it's a part of the DNA of cricket. Despite that fact, actually analytics has not made as much, um, as much progress within the world of cricket. Okay? So it's like baseball, you've got money ball and all that. It's been there forever. In cricket, we're still just getting there. Okay, so for those reasons, it's uh, an exciting time in terms of uh, thinking about analytics in the context of cricket for somebody like me. And actually, thinking about these questions have helped us build exciting methods in statistics that have been, uh, that have eluded us. And for example, it can help you do that trick with your friend. That is only 10 times you toss a coin, and now you have accuracy of as if 100 times you tossed. Okay. And I'll, if I don't sort of explain that how to do that, Make sure you ask me question. Okay, so uh, here are a few interesting statistical questions that uh, we want to study and we've been studying. First is what I would call score forecasting. So what is score forecasting? So imagine that uh, a team is playing and team has played its inning, let's say 50%. And remaining 50% is not played. And I want to figure out what would happen in the remaining 50% given the first half of the team's inning I have watched. Okay. So that means that sort of first order of business would be, well, what will be the final score? But that's uh, too easy in some sense. We are trying to sort of actually predict the entire trajectory. That is, how the runs will increase over the remaining 50%, where the wickets will fall, where the players would get out, and what will be the final number. So all of that. Okay. So doing that prediction itself is a hard statistical problem. And existing methods don't address that. So that's the first question. Next question is, well, you know, we have lots of games being played. Uh, can we use the data that's historically the methods that we have or we can develop that can do automated highlight generation? So 
So what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about soccer, uh, a reasonable way, reasonable set of highlights would be, well, when the goals happen. Okay, that's fine. But then what are the other moments that changed the game? Okay, that really impacted the game. In a sense, that is the highlight. Something that is expected is not really interesting. Something that is un unexpected, something that's beautiful, that is what sort of you want to generate. And the question is that can you generate that in a data-driven manner? Can you do that highlight generation for a game by just looking at its trajectories of, this, uh, of uh, scores and wickets, et cetera, and use that to sort of produce that? Okay. The third is player uh, scoring, now, or player performance rating. Well, one simple way to do player performance is how we measure all players' performances, like batting averages, for example, in the baseball, et cetera. Okay? Uh, well, that's uh, some aggregate score, but that doesn't mean that actually that captures the nuanced player performances for the following reason. Uh, let's say that sort of one can, it's a debatable topic in the context of uh, Argentina and soccer that uh, Maradona has been more successful an important player than Messi. And some of you would agree with that because Argentina has never won, won World Cup in, in the, when Messi has been, but sort of, you know, Maradona has. And, uh, you know, when Messi has scored so many uh, goals and amazing things, so his statistics look amazing compared to Maradona, but maybe by some metric, actually Maradona has been more influential. Now, of course, this is an extreme example to explain what I mean by that. But the question is that, can we design a rating system for players which can actually capture their impact on the game in a more nuanced and more important way rather than just average statistics? Okay. So that's the type of player performance rating that I'm thinking about. And then finally is target revision. And this is, uh, this is actually part of the rule of the game. In the context of cricket, it's known as Duckworth-Lewis system. So Duckworth and Lewis are two statisticians from uh, England, and they have come up with a method. And I would like to argue that actually that's not doing the best thing one can. And the, our, approach, our question was that, can we prove that statistically, that it's wrong, and that's what we have done. But let me sort of first define the question. So remember, I very quickly, briefly commented that cricket is an asymmetric game, unlike many other games. For example, in tennis, at any point of time, both parties are playing. In soccer, at any point of time, both parties are playing and they're playing same role, okay? Uh, in baseball, yes, you switch uh, who balls and who, ba who bats, but those switches are many, nine of them at least. Compared to cricket, that switch is only one. That means at any point of time, each team is playing one or the other role and there are no switches that are happening. Because of that, and because this game is played in countries like England where rain happens, okay? Uh, a team starts batting, okay, bats for the half of the time, okay, their inning is over, next team starts batting, 10% of their inning they have played, rain happens, remaining 40% of the inning is washed out, so now the, the second team cannot play all 100% of its inning, it has to pay 50% of it. So we have to revise the target for the second team. Okay, so for example, first team made 300 runs in full inning. You will say, well, now these guys have 50% of that. Maybe they should play 150 runs, right? That's a bad, bad, bad idea. Okay, and there are many reasons why, and uh, this is not the forum I can sort of explain because of my clock is ticking. The point is this really needs a nuanced way to uh, decide how to, how to reset the target. This is a very interesting causal inference question. And this is uh, uh, an exciting topic of active research for me. Okay, so with that, what I want to do is I don't want to talk about fourth, but I want to talk about first three through one simple illustrative example. Then I want to talk a little bit about the, how we are doing it in one slide, and maybe that's when I would close the loop in terms of that coin toss. And then finally, I'll let you ask questions. All right, so with that, Let's start with uh, score forecasting. So if you want to know, we've got a portal. It's called cricket.mit.edu. Um, you can go there right now if you like. And if you went there right now, here is what it would look like. And if you looked at that, there is a notion of applications there. Click on that. And then you will find, uh, you will eventually lead to this view, which is talking about forecasting. 
Now, of course, uh, this can do live inning forecasting that's going on, or you can insert your own games data and do forecasting if you like. Uh, here, I'm sort of just taking past games just to make sure sort of I, can, I have a ground truth to explain whether some things worked or not. So here's one, inning, one uh, game between India and Australia in uh, 2011. This was World Cup quarterfinal between India and Australia. And again, I have not chosen this game because India won. But it's really interesting. All right, so with that in mind, uh, let's see sort of uh, here is the inning of Australia. What I've done is on x-axis, I have plotted 0 to 300 balls, basically. So think of that as a time. And on y-axis, the numbers, number of runs, or cumulative number of runs that Australia has made till that point. Now imagine that as Australia is playing its inning, 70% of its inning is over, OK? And at that time, you can see that, that their score is somewhere around between 143 to 172. Okay, that, that red thing, dark red thing. Okay? And at that time, I ask you a question. Tell me how the rest of the future would look like. So our algorithm would say it, it looks something like this. It's a, effectively the average trajectory that, it, uh, that will happen going forward from that point onwards. Okay? Now you can say, OK, let the actual game play further and see what happens. Is the setting clear? All right, perfect. And here is what happens. Okay, so naturally, as you would expect, there will be variation, and that's where sort of the end score ends up. Okay, and then you can ask, okay, how close is that? Is that sort of a zoom effect, or is that actual? So here are the actual numbers, and I don't know if you can read it, but it says that actual score was 260 for six. Our prediction was 259 for seven. And I would say that was reasonably accurate. Sounds good? All right, so that's uh, forecasting. Uh, you can say, OK, you did this really well at 70%. What if I move it a little further? Because what if now I just show you 60% of the inning? Okay. So let's say I, I move this further a little, and it's, I'm just showing you only 60%. Not at 70%, but 60%, and I asked you to do forecasting. Same question. So you forecast it, and here is how it looks. Okay, and now you see there's a clear visual gap. And in some sense, well, we have missed the mark. This is not good forecast, right? At least compared to previous one, it's definitely terrible forecast. Okay, so what happened? Clearly, algorithm failed, right? That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is if you are watching this game, and if you remember this game, here is what happened. Okay. The bowler from India, his name is Zahir Khan, very important in this World Cup, effectively the reason why I think India won the World Cup, we can debate that, but uh, he takes two crucial wickets. Okay? Australia was doing amazing, and they would have gone and done much better, but Zahir Khan takes two crucial wickets, and that leads Australia to score less, and that leads, in my mind, winning Australia to lose the game, and India win the game. So one can say, well, if I can identify points in my timeline like this where, you know, let me intervene effectively and see what my forecast would say and what really happened. And if there is a difference, those are the highlights. Those are the unusual points in the game that changed the game's outcome. Okay? And this is, now you can sort of automate how do you generate highlight. Okay? This is just a way to sort of explain through example. Now you can say, OK, this is good, but now I can also attribute this to the fact that actually it was the Zahir Khan who took these wickets which changed the outcome of the game or performance of the eventual uh, performance of the team or opposing, opposing, opposing team. And that means that I can attribute this difference to Zahir Khan. And now I can do this across all the games Zahir Khan has played, uh, across all the times and then build a score, a normalized score for Zahir Khan versus somebody else. Okay? And this is how I can sort of identify how important and influential is a player in changing the performance of the other team or outcome of its own, his or her own team's uh, performance. Okay? All right, so that's sort of uh, through one simple example, hopefully I have given you uh, intuition of how one would go about solving three problems. 
Now one can ask the question, all of these relied on the fact that I have a very good forecasting algorithm. So where did the forecasting algorithm come? And that's effectively what I would call a secret sauce. First, let me explain in simple terms what this is. Um, I know I've got only five minutes left, right? So I'll sort of try to be brief here. But his idea that while I don't know what's going to happen in future for this game, there are many other games in the past that have happened that look similar to this game's performance till this point. So let me somehow use those similar games to complete what's going to happen in future. The problem, of course, is, or rather the devil lies in the detail, that is how do you find those similar things, okay? And to do that and understand that and learn that well from really, really little amount of data, what we do is we have developed uh, this new method which we call multidimensional robust synthetic control. It's an, um, uh, in my mind, it's a really interesting uh, uh, way to do causal inference with observational data. Think of it this way that if you want to evaluate uh, what will be the impact of gun control or any such policy on a state, well, you can't do randomized trial. You can't have two Massachusetts where one Massachusetts has gun control, another does, does not have gun control, and see what happens to crime rate simultaneously. That's a terrible thing to do. You can't do that because we can't do not have two Massachusetts. All right, so the point is that, or rather it's very ridiculous the way I'm saying it. So we need some method, and that's the method that sort of uh, we've developed. And again, it came because of cricket in my mind. Uh, if we were not looking at this problem, we would not have developed this method and all of that stuff. And now this is the time for me to quickly explain you how you would get better out of your friend's coin without tossing it. You ready? Here's what you'll do. Go and find 1,000 other random coins. Toss each one of them 10 times and then use this method and that will happen, that will work, okay? So the trick is, your friend is not tossing a coin, but there are 1,000 other coins that you're tossing 10 times. Now imagine if all of those 1,000 coins were exactly like your friend's coin, you're getting effectively 1,000 times 10, so this is 10,000 coin tosses, okay? Of course, that's not exactly what's happening, but somehow through this method, you will be able to stitch those things together. All right, I think uh, these are just numbers saying that, yeah, that example that I showed you was not a fluke. Actually, in principle, really, this method works well. For example, you can do uh, in a median within 2.7% uh, error and so on and so forth. Uh, using, uh, there's a sort of a notion of Stein's paradox shows up here where to predict performance of innings of India, actually using innings of Pakistan and Australia and England actually helps rather than not. And it's related to this coin example. Okay, that is, using somebody else's coin tosses, you can actually get better estimation of your own coin. Okay? So with that, I think I'm almost near the end of the time, and I should leave a few minutes for question and answer. If you're interested in cricket, stay tuned. A lot more is going to come at Cricket ML. If you're not interested in cricket, go play that coin toss game with your friends. Thank you. Question, yeah. Great question. So uh, we have, um, so short answer is no, it's not difficult to do that. However, we have had a lot of, we are spending a lot of time just sort of understanding how these methods work for One Day International. But my belief would be that it's uh, just a matter of time to apply them to T20. Great question. Okay, good, so uh, a question here is that, uh, it's a very interesting question, first of all, from cricket perspective. Question is that uh, if many people sort of comment that, you know, a, one drop of a catch actually led to one team winning or losing, okay? And uh, dropping of a catch is like sort of uh, losing an opportunity to um, uh, get a wicket or make a, an, a player who is batting really well out, okay? Now, how does sort of our method can help doing that? So as I was explaining you in the context of highlight, let's imagine that you know that sort of ball number 200 is when ball, the catch was dropped. So go back a little, okay? And then uh, 
at that point, let's assume that a wicket falls versus a wicket does not fall and do score forecasting. That will sort of help you understand sort of what sort of difference can be made. Great question. Yes. Uh, uh, I think you were first. Good. So I think, uh, just paraphrasing your question, there are lots of analogies with baseball. So let's assume that some of these methods have, hopefully, uh, generality and extensions available to other uh, sports too. And I, I would like to believe that too. So with that hypothesis, uh, if one were to answer the question that sort of, uh, can we sort of utilize other sorts of information and understand whether that information actually helps or not, right? So the purpose of, uh, okay, the slides are gone, understandably, because my time is up. but. Uh, Multi-dimensional uh, robust synthetic control, where the idea was that in the context of cricket, there are two dimensions we used, score and the wicket, to predict just scores. Uh, you could actually add the weather to uh, some other information as well. And what, uh, as a core of our method, is that you can keep adding whatever information you like. We have a test that tells you whether this adding this is going to help or not. And if you pass that test, you use it in a way and then see what comes out. Uh, okay, I'm going to sort of go a little biased in this direction, so that sort of there's a geographic coverage, yes? All right, so the question is that are we trying to emulate certain type of deliveries that are thrown called reverse swings, et cetera, using some other type of data? It's a great question. Um, I think uh, wh the way I think I would like to answer that question is that is there a way for me to, let's say, look at something and try to predict what will happen to the trajectory of the ball or things like that? that those type of things might be sort of feasible, but uh, I'm not sure sort of exactly what emulation means. Potentially, we can take it offline. Okay. Uh, can I continue sort of taking questions? Three more, Three more minutes? Okay. All right. So, yes, sir. Great question. So uh, let me sort of paraphrase your question. The one way I can sort of paraphrase your question is that, well, you know, here we are using only uh, the score trajectories and the wickets, which is just statistics. What about using information about what team is playing? What about using the player information, their age, their, you know, where the game is played, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much other information, right? So. Uh, the point is that sort of there was the whole idea behind this multi-dimensional version where we want to predict score, but there are many other pieces of the information that you have. Question is, can you put them together? What our method does is that you take all of that data together, you run a test. So you say, here's a score. Let's say you are saying the, the, the ground conditions. You put that information, run a test. The test might tell you that this is a bad idea to add this data set for the purpose of this prediction, and you don't do that. If the test says that's fine, you add to it, you keep adding more and more things in this way. And the, the theory tells you that actually, if those tests pass with more and more data, you're getting better and better ways to find these similar things, which will help you refine your estimation. Yes. And I guess that's from the score forecasting. Yes. And is their performance something that we can use again to for score forecasting? Uh, because it seems like you calculate something like a log. Yeah. Like a, Correct. And then so it, it, it can, is that something that can be used for So again, in principle, yes. If we had that data and we stacked it up, put it as a part of the same method see sort of it passes our test saying that this data actually will help you do pre better predictions, we, we can use it. If it does say you can't, then sort of we won't use it. At least our method would not sort of help you. 
you might come up with a new method and that's fine. Okay. All right. Okay, I think I should uh, stop here. Thank you everyone for attention and so if you have any questions, I'm happy to take offline.